In the days following the defeat of Zaitan, a new force for chaos and destruction lay siege to Tyria. Her name was Scarlet Briar, and this was her war. Following the Pact's victory and the death of Zaitan, new ships appeared in Lion's Arch bearing a strange mark. The Consortium had arrived in the city and were advertising a new resort. Meanwhile, whales started beaching themselves on the shores of the city and rumors began to circle about sea monsters. Head researcher Levy arrived in Lion's Arch with her crew and began researching strange readings, signaling that something big was out in the ocean and incoming. She tried desperately to convince Captain Magnus of the Captain's Council of this, but unless something attacked Lion's Arch or threatened the city's trade, he would do nothing. Soon thereafter, a race of enormous crab-like beasts known as Karka attacked the city and the commander was forced to fight them back. A citizen of Lion's Arch, Inspector Keel, was tasked with finding out what had riled the Karka up, while Levy searched for a way to defeat them. Meanwhile, Karka attacks continued in Garenhof and Morgan's Spiral. Keel's investigation utilized the commander to discover links from wreckage on the beaches to the consortium. Ultimately, the commander was led to Kanark, a Silvari secondborn in Garenhof. Kanark had been in charge of an expedition to an unknown and recently discovered island as a part of a consortium group. They had planned to make it into a resort for profit and had aggravated the local wildlife, Karka. Kanark was taken into custody. Later, the commander asked Miyani and Zomaros about the Karka, finding that they're an old race who used to live in deep waters from ages ago but seemed to have been driven recently to the surface. Soon, the Karka attacked for a second time, but the commander was armed with a powerful solvent and was able to fight them back with much greater ease. Kiel brought the commander to South Sun Cove itself as the Lion Guard took the beach and blazed trails across the unknown island, an event to ultimately conclude with the defeat of a powerful ancient Karka in the heart of the island. Inspector Keel and Researcher Levy remained there to learn more about the Karka and help prevent future issues for Lion's Arch, but Kanak escaped during the chaos. Next year, after the merriment and festivities of Winter's Day had concluded, on the far side of the continent by the Shiver Peaks, strange storms and attacks began to brew, forcing both Char and Norn refugees of the area from the wreckage of their homes. They struggled to find shelter in the south, ultimately sprawling into the capital's Holbrack and the Black Citadel. The Wolfborn and Adamant Guard were unable to gather any information about the attacks from the traumatized refugees, but many were saying that Dredge had been sighted. However, uncharacteristically, these dredge had been seen using fire magic. The unusual weather patterns were later discovered to be caused by steam erupting from underground, wreaking havoc on air temperature and humidity, but the specific cause for this steam was unknown. After the influx of refugees, many sought new shelters. A good number of them began traveling to Lion's Arch, where a generous benefactor was providing supplies within the city's walls. This was revealed to be the Consortium, who was set to give the refugees new homes on the hostile South Sun Cove. After the initial attacks, the perpetrator's assault started to become more brazen, and sightings of Flame Legion Char and Dredge became increasingly common. The Flame Legion were noticed using Dredge technology, causing speculation of an alliance between the two. The Molten Alliance, as they were called, had been spying on the locals to gather information. The Black Citadel convened a war council to assess the situation and what actions should be taken by the Char. Due to the publicity of the attacks, the Order of Whispers and the Vigil as individual factions, not acting as the Pact, started to contribute against the Alliance. The Order of Whispers sent a double agent to gather information from the inside, while the Vigils set their efforts to tracking down Molten Alliance bases. During this time, 
A young Norn traveled to the Black Citadel to request assistance for the defense of his homestead, Cragstead, which was recently captured by the Alliance. However, he was turned away as the char was spread thin and couldn't spare any soldiers, but also because the young Norn, named Bram, claimed he was the son of the legendary heir Stagolkin and the late Borge the Sun Chaser. Ritlock Brimstone, not believing the Norn, dismissed him as a liar and sent him to Holbrack instead. When Bram arrived at the Norn capital, he was again denied any aid, this time by Newt Whitebear. White Bear had chosen to focus on the defense of the city rather than sending men out into the field, and so once again, Bram was left alone. He was discovered to hold resentment towards his mother, Air, and that the two seemed to have been estranged for much of his life. He chose to retake his homestead with only a few allies on his quest and was ultimately successful with the commander's help. Cragstead was freed from the influence of the Molten Alliance, however, many were taking hostage to an unknown location that Bram would become determined to find. While the Legion's War Council was in session, a Gladium Char, who had lost her entire warband in a mining accident and now sought to join Ritlock's Stone Warband, was sent to retake the Nolan Hatchery as a part of a trial for her entry. This was Rock's Whetstone. The Nolan Hatchery was a strategic stronghold for the Legions, as it was a main supply of siege devourers. Once more, with the assistance of the Pact Commander, Rox was able to succeed in her mission. The Nolan Hatchery had been secured, and in so doing, she befriended an albino baby devourer that would join her on her travels henceforth. She named it Frostbite. Meanwhile, with their double agent planted within the Molten Alliance, the Order of Whispers was able to retrieve some valuable information. The Alliance had been expanding, digging east, south and west. Prisoners were being taken every day, some put in pens and others used for weapons testing, testing the unstable but undeniably powerful flame and dredge technological combination. However, cracks in the Alliance were beginning to show, as the Char did not like being so deep underground, so far from the sun. Unfortunately, the Order of Whispers still could not discern the reason for this alliance, but that something had pushed these two factions together. Soon, the Vigil were able to find the entrance to a molten base and moved in. They were joined by Bram, still seeking retribution for Cragstead and the rescue of his companions, and Rox, still invested in joining the Stone Warband. The three were in one another's company for the first time, and something of a new band of adventuring heroes was perhaps showing its very first signs of life. Together, the heroes and Vigil raided the weapons facility. The cause for the steam was discovered to be the Alliance's use of fire technology to mine underground. They were able to cave in the facilities by detonating the caverns, crippling the Molten Alliance in the aftermath. In the final days of the battles, Dredge and Flame Legion captives who were interrogated revealed that the Alliance had been run by a city dweller. But this city dweller was shrouded in secrecy. Their current location or aliases were unknown by any question. With more facilities being found and shut down by the Vigil and others, it was not long before the activities of the Molten Alliance became very quiet and distant once again. The merchants and traders of the Consortium had given shelter to refugees driven from their lands by the Molten Alliance, but many of the new arrivals felt more like prisoners than guests. They were being offered shelter on South Sun, they later discovered that they were bound to the island by law of contract and couldn't leave, legally speaking. The consortium was moving forward with turning the island into a resort, and several tourists as well as nobles were already arriving on vacation. Among the many nobles to arrive on the island was Lord Farron, and also Casimir Mead of Divinity's Reach. With her own agenda at play, Mead had arrived in fact on the island to fact find for an unseen private investigator in Divinity's Reach. 
While those who could pay seemed to be having a reasonable time on the island, refugees fleeing from the Molten Alliance and now bound to the cove were becoming entirely restless. The cove was under Lion's Arch's jurisdiction, and so, in response, Captain Magnus ordered the Lion Guard to deal with the situation. They brought with them Inspector Ellen Keel, who had dealt with the events of the cove in the previous year. She set about learning of the consortium there and their activities. She found that Subdirector Null of the consortium had been assigned to oversee the work of the refugees and the establishment of the resort. With the help of his golem, Jobotron, he berated and subjected the settlers continuously throughout the day. When arguments arose around the resort, Null was using violent means to subdue and suppress those altercations. When the riots began to escalate to deaths of consortium members, management expressed their extreme displeasure with Null's handling of the resettlement operation. And in response, Null was rejected himself passage off the island and directed to salvage what he could from the company's investment into the island resort. Ellen Keel had seen all this, but was limited in what she could do. When the effects of the riots increased rapidly into savagery, a rioter met with Keel to confess her part in the attacks. The settler revealed that it was a mysterious Silvari who had enticed her more than anything else into rioting over the contracts that bound her there. This Silvari had been undermining the consortium in this way all across the island. Kiel was able to deduce that this Silvari instigator was most likely someone who knew South Sun Cove well and had been here before, and someone who had a grudge against the consortium. There was only one name that fit the bill. Kanak. After the death of the ancient Karka in the events of the closing 1325, Kanak had fled from his capture at the hands of the Lion Guard, becoming a fugitive. Throughout his flight, he was being hunted by the consortium's decommissioned teams for betraying the company. Due to his gruelling exposure in the wild and his hardships while being hunted down, Kanak's appearance had changed now, becoming darker and grimmer. During the events of the Molten Alliance, Kanak felt sympathy for the refugees and aided the vigil in raiding weapon facilities in secret. He'd forged gauntlets of fused technology that he began to wear as a symbol, seeing himself now as a hero of the people. It was later discovered that Subdirector Null was the individual sending hitmen after Kanak. Null blamed the events of the past year solely on Kanak and not the responsibility of the consortium and these events had caused him to grow a deep hatred for the Subdirector and South Sun Cove's project. After Kanak was discovered to be on the island, a search went out and soon his hideout was located. After he was immobilized, Kiel wondered why a man would come back after he was free. But Kanak saw himself as a symbol of hope and truly saw himself as helping the settlers, albeit through violent, dirty means. He believed as long as the contracts were destroyed, good had been done any means necessary. In response to Kanak's plan to destroy all the contracts, Ellen Keel gathered them to be sent back to Lion's Arch. Although Ellen herself found the consortium's legal loopholes to be loathsome, she nonetheless was Lion Guard and considered it her duty to uphold the law above all else. Even if she agreed with him, Kanak's vigilante justice couldn't fly. Surprisingly, however, when the contracts were loaded onto a vessel to take them back to the mainland, to the astonishment of all looking on, the ship was remotely detonated, burning the entire thing to a cinder and sinking it to the bottom of the Sea of Sorrows, the contracts included. While it seemed pretty clear that Keel had been the one to orchestrate this, she claimed no responsibility, keeping her slate clean and destroying the contracts in the process. With the settlers now once again allowed to leave, with the agitated local wildlife and rioting causing discomfort for the holidaymakers, many left South Sun Cove for good, leaving Subdirector Null and just a few others behind in misery.
Several weeks after the conflict with Kanark and the consortium on South Sun Cove, the first annual Dragon Bash Festival was held to honour the defiant spirit of Tyria against the Elder Dragons. Dragon Bash was inspired by the old Canthan Dragon Festival, but with a twist to fit the modern day realities of the Elder Dragon threat. The ship's council in Lion's Arch hosted the event to celebrate the collective victories against the dragons past, present and hopefully future. The festival saw a decoration of Lion's Arch, nighttime fireworks and activities. The main attraction of the festival was the effigy lighting ceremony. Before the ceremony began, something strange happened. The commander received a notification from an individual they did not know. They were named E. E claimed in their letter that there was a threat to the council and something had to be done to protect it. The mysterious person explained they would intervene themselves, but circumstances prevented it and it was up to the commander to keep their eye out. Then, during the ceremony and just as was warned, disaster struck. An unusual electrical explosion detonated in the vicinity of the councillors. The explosion injured many, including three council members. The line guard were instantly on the scene, with Inspector Ellen Keel at their helm. As Keel and the commander attempted to expel the chaos, a woman from the crowd volunteered to try and heal the wounded. It was later announced that one of the council members did not survive the attack. Captain Theo Ashford was killed. This seemingly senseless act caused outcry back in Divinity's reach and Logan Thackeray wanted to get to the bottom of it. He located private investigator Marjorie Delacroix in the dead end bar of the Eastern Commons. Marjorie was the private investigator Lady Casimir was fact finding for on South Sun Cove. Thackeray explained to her that Ashford was an old friend and he wanted to know who was behind the attack personally. Logan paid Marjorie handsomely for the investigation and she set to work. Marjorie, a woman who lived near her sisters in Divinity's Reach, had once worked for the Ministry Guard. Curiously, and perhaps not coincidentally, she had left that organisation many years ago after a brief encounter with a mysterious person calling themselves E. While Marjorie was not able to discern E's true identity, they were nonetheless able to convince her that although the Ministry Guard had become corrupt and flawed and she no longer identified with them, she could still do good on her own working as a private investigator. In the fallout of the Dragon Bash assassination, Delacroix met up with Keel at Lion's Arch who assisted with the investigation. It was quickly learned that not only was the explosion not an accident, but that the thoughtful woman who had offered to heal the injured moments afterwards was linked to the cause of the disaster. The name of this woman was Mai Trin. When the commander and allies managed to capture her and interrogated her, she begrudgingly revealed that her plan was to fill Theo Ashford's seat at the council for herself. Having been caught, Trin called several pirate allies to her side. They were not geared as typical pirates though, well funded and equipped with arcane electrical equipment that made them a serious threat. They called themselves Aetherblades, and with the help of her Aetherblade thugs, Mitrin was able to escape. Following the investigation of the attack, and with the perpetrator revealed, it was Inspector Ellen Keel of the Lion Guard that stepped forwards in search of the Aetherblades hideout. It was a difficult task, as the Aetherblades had demonstrated a mastery in acquisition of the holographic technologies of the Asura, and they could use this to conceal themselves, often in plain sight, building cliff faces and walls where none truly existed. But the Aetherblades were not always in hiding. Quickly the existence of this new faction became clear to the peoples of Tyria, as unlike most pirate armadas that would stick to the seas, the Aetherblades sailed not the waters, but the skies. After the pact's development of airships in their campaign against Zaitan, these Aetherblade thugs had somehow acquired and replicated the technology for themselves, and a new breed of airborne villain now faced Tyrion. Ultimately, the main Aetherblade hideout was discovered, near Lion's Arch, and concealed behind a holographic projector wall. 
Alan Keel raided the hideout with the commander. Together, they were met with deadly resistance by many pirates and traps. The true extent of how well funded the Aether Blades were became quickly clear. As Keel descended through the spiraling base, perhaps unsurprisingly, Inquest started to appear amongst the Aetherblades, defending them and thus revealing where Mitrin's people had found their technology, in an unlikely alliance with the nefarious Asura. Far at the back of the hideout, the commander and Keel came across Mai Trin, who they overheard in conversation with her first mate, speaking of an individual named Scarlet. They seemed to fear this Scarlet and the repercussions for unsuccessfully having opened the council seat. Trin was attempting to flee the base on her airship, but Keel and the commander were successful in halting her escape and taking her prisoner. Upon interrogating Mai Trin and other captured Aetherblades, no other information was gathered about the mysterious individual they named Scarlet. Meanwhile, Captain Magnus had discovered that Theo Ashford II, the man who should have taken his seat at the council in the event of his death, had been unknowingly murdered several weeks earlier. This left Lion's Arch with an empty seat, and a new councillor had to be nominated. Magnus, impressed with Keel's instrumental successes in the protection of Lion's Arch over recent months, nominated her for the seat. Keel accepted the honour. Though she wasn't initially a captain, she chose to commandeer Mai Trin's docked airship for herself, becoming Captain Ellen Keel, eligible for a seat on the ship's council. Mai Trin could only look on, imprisoned and tight-lipped. A short time later, the elusive Bazaar of the Four Winds arrived in Tyria for the first time in a long while. It was not necessarily related to recent events or the activities of Lion's Arch at all. It was a noted traveling black market that settled in the southern Shiver Peaks, where merchants traded in rare and unique goods at a lower price than that of many suppliers in the capital cities around the continent, effectively undercutting their business. The cutthroat, puritanical ship's council of Lion's Arch naturally became interested in this opportunity. Ellen Keel was not the only captain running for Theo Ashford's old seat at the table. Evan Nashblade, owner of the Black Lion Trading Company, was self-nominated for the position also. This caused heavy friction and competition between the two nominees that they sought to resolve by procuring a profitable trade deal with the infamous Bazaar. The council attempted such a feat many times before, but was always rejected. Therefore, the notion was seen as a noteworthy characteristic of a captain to be on the council. The bazaar was operated out of the Zephyr Sanctum and its associated fleets, an airborne town that endlessly drifted through the skies as packed airships might, but hewn from wood and set afloat by crystalline magics few interior understood. The people who built these vast flying vessels, this sailing skyward town, and who ran the bazaar, were known as the Zephyrites. A secluded, zen-like organization composed primarily of humans of Canthan or Elonian descent. The Zephyrites rarely docked on land, and mostly did so to gather supplies, choosing to live in the air for years at a time. This caused many of the Zephyrites to be disconnected with the world around them, showing ignorance toward the Silvari race, the truce between the humans and the Char, and many other recent but significant historical events. Upon landing, the Zephyrites would sometimes be convinced to take on board new allies, and this is ultimately what they did with a new creature to them, a Silvari called Aerin, who joined their ranks. The Derman Priory were able to discover more about the enigmatic organization during the bazaar. They discovered that the Zephyrites were in fact successors of the Brotherhood of the Dragon, a group of dwarves who historically, hundreds of years ago, had worked in close allegiance and communication with the Dragon Glint of the Crystal Desert. After the transformation of the dwarves to stone, Glint passed on the guardianship to a select few humans instead who now wander the skies using her magics as Zephyrites. 
When Glint was killed by the elder dragon Kraukatoric in 1320 AE, six years ago, the Zephyrites trekked to the location of her corpse to prevent the magic imbued within it from falling into the wrong hands. It was there that they found the magics they used to stay afloat, calling them the Aspects, and with them, they decided to build the Zephyr Sanctum, a place they could live above the clouds and study the Aspects and the ways of Glint in peace. Indeed, during the bazaar, Glint's influence on this faction was clear. They held her with deep reverence, singing songs of her legacy. The leader of the Zephyrites, and the man who Keel and Evan Nashblade would have to barter with, was known as the Master of Peace. And after a lengthy pirate voting session was concluded, it was Ellen Keel who won his favour and secured both the trade deal with Lion's Arch and a seat for herself at the Captain's Council. The Zephyrites took to the skies again, not to be seen for many months. In the year 1316 AE, Queen Jenna had been crowned as the Crichton Queen and ascended the throne. In the year now, 1326, on the 10th anniversary of her coronation, Queen Jenna hosted a jubilee to celebrate her 10-year reign as the Crichton Monarch. The Queen of Crichton reclaimed the Great Collapse within Divinity's Reach and constructed a towering pavilion in the symbol of a griffin, the symbol on Crichton's crest. Although the celebration was in the name of Jenna's 10th anniversary, she also wanted to hold the Jubilee to show the other nations that humanity had not fallen and was not recessing. Emissaries from all the nation's interior were invited to marvel at the ingenuity of humanity's survival. Along with the newly opened pavilion, the crown also unveiled humanity's next leap in technology. The Watch Knights. The Watch Knights resembled golems in the fact that they were sentient beings tailored for commands by their superiors, where the golemancers of the Asuri use Magitek to control their golems, Watch Knights were controlled through verbal commands issued by Mesmer Magic. The creatures were used throughout the pavilion as guards and as attractions. As the majority of emissaries began to arrive to the celebration, Queen Jenna commenced the opening ceremony. Many champions of Kryta arrived to the ceremony at Jenna's call to test the Watch Knight's strength, including Ritlock Brimstone. Ultimately, the Queen chose her own personal champion, Captain Logan Thackeray, to fight one of the Watch Knights in a display match. With Mesmer Magic by Countess Anise, the Watch Knight continuously changed physical forms, Logan fighting each one. When Anise attempted to shut it down, however, she found that the commands had been overridden. Suddenly, Aetherblade pirates rained down on the ceremony, causing chaos around the arena. Throughout the fighting, Anise deduced that whoever had overwritten the Watch Knight's commands had to be nearby, and she noticed a mysterious figure perched on one of the columns in the area. By order of the Queen, Rox Whetstone, also at the ceremony with her new friend Bram, attempted to shoot the stranger down with her bow. The mysterious figure continued to teleport and toy with the young Char before, at last, fleeing the scene when Rox managed to strike her. Although Divinity's Reach authorities were on high alert for the mysterious stranger for the rest of the festival, they did not reappear until the very closing ceremony. Queen Jenna had taken the stage of the pavilion, giving her speech on humanity's resolve, unity and strength, when it was quickly interrupted by the fugitive. This time, they had their hood down, and their face was revealed to the world. The stranger was a female Silvari, naming herself Scarlet Briar. She laughed at the endurance and trials of the human race and began explaining how fragile the Crichton society truly was. To prove her point, the Silvari was able to control the Crichton Watch Knights, transforming them into twisted, horrific machinery. As the horrors began to cause chaos around the pavilion, Scarlet attempted to kidnap the Queen. As the maniacal Silvari shot an explosive bullet onto the stage in an attempt to capture the Queen, Lord Farron attempted to rescue her. It was later revealed that the Jenna on stage commencing the closing ceremony was not Jenna at all, 
but in fact a mesmeric illusion created by a niece in an attempt to bait this mysterious fugitive forward. The plan had worked, but as the knowledge of the plan was only limited to the Queen and the Shining Blade, Farron had now been pointlessly caught in the crossfire and fallen into the arena level of the pavilion below with Scarlet Briar sealed away. As chaos above continued, the commander was tasked with finding a way into the arena. The Shining Blade assisted, learning what they could of this terrorist, and also an emissary from Ratasum, an Asura named Vorp, offered his insights. Vorp was able to distinguish that the Silvari was traveling via Asura teleportation, similar to that he'd seen amongst his own kind. Not only this, but Vorp realized the method of teleportation was specifically tied to one of Tyria's other great enigmas in recent years. The mysterious and deadly steam machines that had warped via teleporters at various places throughout the Shiver Peaks and whose purpose was utterly undiscernible. It was with the technology from these creatures that Scarlet had been able to teleport around and cause so much havoc. With this knowledge in hand, the commander and company were able to reverse engineer the technique. They dismantled the bombs Scarlet had set throughout the city, broke inside the otherwise impenetrable arena area, and were able to save Lord Farron from Scarlet's clutches before her hasty escape via Aetherblade airship. Once again, the people of Tyria were left in the dark and empty-handed, but at least now there was a name and a face to their antagonist. After learning of the connection between the Aetherblades who had assaulted their city and Scarlet, the Lion Guard began to list her as a high priority target. More than law enforcement, the Pirate Haven wanted vengeance for the death of Councillor Theo Ashford. Intelligence gathered that the fugitive was likely located in Twilight Arbor, the now emptied Nightmare Court stronghold within Silvari territory on the Tarnished Coast. Scarlet did not declare herself for Countess Foulane or the court, yet was stationed there nonetheless. By orders of Magnus, the Lion Guards spearheaded a raid far from their city on the Arbor itself, only to discover when they arrived that firstborn Kaith was also on the scene with her own agenda. Kaith revealed that Scarlet was once known as Kiara, she had been a deeply curious and inquisitive secondborn who quickly left the Pale Tree after birth. Kaith explained that Scarlet sent a direct challenge to her from this arbor, claiming to know the darkest secrets of the Silvari, secrets that not even Foulane knew of, information only Kaith seemed privy to. This had instantly caught Kaith's attention, who was deeply concerned about the suggestion, but she would not share details on the specifics with the commander. Kaith decided to work with the Lion Guard in her mission. While they assaulted the front door and went the direct route, Kaith would attempt to undermine Scarlet's newly built mechanical fortress here from the shadows. As expected, the team was met with heavy resistance from Aetherblades, and curiously, steam creatures themselves now fought in allegiance with them. Littered throughout the mechanical fortress was more holographic technology in use, the holograms depicting Scarlet arrogantly jibing and berating the intruders with Scarlet's voice and sentiment, but never revealing her true motivation. It did become clear, however, as the group passed through the stronghold, that this was likely one of a few locations the Aetherblades were using to build their airships and train new recruits. Within the heart of the facility, Scarlet managed to apprehend Kaith and continued to berate the now incarcerated Firstborn. Yet, when the commander was able to storm the center of the facility, shutting down a domineering clockwork oak heart in the process, it became clear that Scarlet had never been there at all. Everything encountered had only been pre-recorded messages, illusions and technologies to trick and taunt the intruders and Kaith in particular. The Lion Guard were able to storm the facility and shut it down, but Scarlet seemed to know this. She had always been one step ahead. 
using this time to plot for more havoc elsewhere. Kaith, forced to leave empty-handed, still concerned about this secret of the Silvari Scarlet supposedly knew. Over a year after the fall of the Elder Dragon Zaitan, as Mad King Thorn's Day arrived once again to Lion's Arch, local Seraph to Kessex Hills in Kryta documented a heavy increase in deforestation around the Viathan Lake. Soon, deep out in the crate infested waters manifested an enormous, illusory veil that encircled the centre of the lake, concealing it from view and stretching high into the sky. The veil was thought to be a mesmeric construction, and as such, Casimir Mead, a prominent human mesmer, was called into action once again. Marjorie joined her, and after several weeks from the veil first going up, the two were able to crack it and peer behind. What they saw was an astonishing construct, a massive tower built of countless woods gathered from the forests around the area, now barren, was enrobing and propping up an insidious, enormous plant. A plant that stretched from the base of the lake high into the sky. It seemed an unnatural and sinister life form. Soon after unveiling the tower, Mead and Delacroix were ambushed. Yes, by Crate of the area, who likely knew of the tower's construction and seemed to be involved, but also Nightmare Court, who seemed in league with them for this project. This final unlikely pairing was soon known as the Toxic Alliance. Toxic because, as the orders of Tyria and the commander arrived, the peoples of Tyria realized that this tower and the plant within was spouting a destructive magical toxin that clouded the entire region of the lake. This toxin, when inhaled, caused mass hallucinations and sickness. Those afflicted would see hellish visions of spiders and worms and all manner of things that shouldn't be able to do harm, but did. When a group of soldiers went into the tower to scout and learn more of the plant that it concealed, they never returned. This toxin was a threat. A Dermond Priory scholar named Ella McKay went to work at deducing a reason for the unlikely alliance of Crate and Nightmare Courtiers. She found that the court had offered the Crate revered obelisk shards from the unending ocean. They'd convinced them that this meant the return of the crate's holy prophets, thus winning their temporary allegiance. Ella was also able to conclude that the Nightmare Silvari aiding the crate were likely only an offshoot of the actual courtiers following the ways of Cadian and Faulain, surmising these Nightmare Courts were a fringe group, banished likely from even the Nightmare Court itself for their radical ideas. At the same time, Marjorie Delacroix had set about working on an antitoxin that would counter the effects of the tower, whose hallucinogenic and contaminating properties had continued to grow in severity and lethality. By gathering samples from the various offshoots of the tower, Marjorie was able to create an effective antitoxin, allowing relative safety into the heart of the fortress. While traversing the tower, Illusions and hallucinations continued to blur the minds of its victims, leading them astray. Casimir Mead took the lead, knowing the effects of illusions better than many of her companions. That said, it was a nervy affair, with Casimir uncontrollably hiccuping along the way, revealed to be a nervous tick for her whenever she's afraid. It was realised that the tower was being defended not only by the newly created Toxic Alliance, but also by Aetherblade pirates, by Molten Alliance, and by Clockwork Minions, connecting so many recent and unconclusive events to this one place. Scarlet had been responsible for them all. Scarlet had orchestrated the Molten Alliance as the city dweller. She had brought together the Aetherblade pirates, and now the Toxic Alliance with the manufacturing of this toxin. She had to be stopped. Upon reaching the top of the tower, the trio of heroes, Marjorie, Kazmir, and the Pact Commander, entered the heart of the enormous plant it kept safe. They were keen to inject Delacroix's antitoxin and end its effects on the province. 
As they did so, however, utilizing her steam creature teleportation technology, Scarlet Briar appeared before them. The clearly deranged and crazed Silvari they had gotten a taste for in the Twilight Arbor berated them and stole away a sample of her newly created toxic plant seeds. Before any real action could be taken against this, a swollen cocoon in the plant burst forth and a toxic hybrid crate monstrosity attacked, allowing Scarlet to escape in the ensuing action. The toxic alliance had created new life here, an abomination that the crates seemed to genuinely believe was one of their prophets manifest. With its defeat, Marjorie at last injected her antitoxin, forcing the whole tower to collapse over the Kessex Hills. It was a catastrophic event, sending shards of wood and deforested timber all about the area, scarring its appearance for years to come. In the aftermath of the destruction of the tower, at a nearby campsite operated by various members of the Orders of Tyria, Marjorie and Kazmir met with Rox and Bram, who had been part of an assault force into the tower for the first time, and the heroes began to bond. The effects of the tower, once standing in Kessex Hills, continued to linger within the province, although in a weakened and far less deadly state. Back in Lion's Arch, the now elected Captain Ellen Keel, under the authority of the Lion Guard and the Captain's Council, sought to conduct research on the Thormanova reactor disaster. This had been a great magical explosion caused by the Asura in distant areas of the continent a few years ago. The research was done in the Fractal of the Mists, allowing the Lion Guard and company to relive the Thormanova disaster firsthand and truly witness what had occurred without suffering the devastating effects of the actual explosion. It was revealed there in this Fractal that, years ago, before anyone knew her name, None other than Scarlet Briar was there at the reactor site. She advised the inquest and tampered with their operations. With them, Scarlet had made a breakthrough in understanding of magic, identifying a crucial network of magical channels known as ley lines that crisscrossed the globe deep underground, beneath the surface of Tyria. Scarlet's tampering, mixing dragon and chaos magic together, had caused the meltdown, but she left before being caught in its wake. Keel and company were offered a unique glimpse of the meltdown. Here, in the heart of the chaos, a curious creature of magical energy appeared that none had seen before. This humanoid entity was labelled an anomaly. It was hostile, a seemingly sentient thing born of and around the intense energies of the reactor explosion. And then, once the meltdown was over, it was gone again. In the new year, more mysterious changes began to appear throughout Tyria. The vigil documented the appearance of several curious new probes that had been constructed and left in various seemingly random places throughout the wilderness and far reaches of the continent. Then, soon after, within False River Valley of Lornar's Pass in the Shiver Peaks, appeared an enormous, ominous, floating, constructed metal platform. It was spotted hanging ominously in the sky. It deployed an equally horrific, twisted marionette, vaguely resembling the Watch Knights of Krita, but clearly manufactured by Scarlet. The marionette sought to bring destruction to the Shiver Peaks. The Dermon Priory surmised that it was a weapon of sorts and were tasked with shutting it down. Joining the fight against the machine was the Commander, Marjorie, Kazmir, Rox, and Bram all together who all had history and ambition to bring down Scarlet and her schemes. Amongst the crowds, too, was a young Asuran prodigy named Taimi, no more than a minuscule Asura child, a small girl with a golem named Scruffy. Taimi's parents were long since dead, and she'd been studying beneath Zodger at Ratasum until the machinations of Scarlet had encouraged her to leave the Asuran city. Interestingly, Taimi showed extreme admiration for Scarlet and for her work, explaining that being a homicidal maniac does not make you any less of a genius. 
Destroying the marionette was no easy task, but it could be done. And after its defeat, Rox theorized that Scarlet didn't actually care whether it won or lost against them. Maybe she saw this as something of a stress test. When the group expressed their concern over the mysterious probes that had appeared too, Timey, newly becoming acquainted with the group, reassured them that unlike the marionette, the probes did not seem to be manufactured for deadly reasons. Instead, they appeared to be searching for something. An observation later echoed by Ritlock Brimstone and a collection of Char who were also exploring the matter. But none could say what the probes were looking for. During this time, several discoveries and conversations about Scarlet occurred. The Dermond Priory discovered a secret lab of hers beneath their own halls, with various hints and suggestions about her past. It did not seem Scarlet wanted the Priory to find this, and so was a treasure trove of information. Scarlet, at one point on her several years on Tyria, had perhaps unsurprisingly gone to study with the Asura at Ratasum. Specifically though, amongst the College of Synergetics, she seemed to have fallen into the unexpected. With an Asura named Omad, the two of them had built a machine to observe and tamper with the eternal alchemy itself. Scarlet was the one to use the machine first, but when she did, it seemed to have broken her mind and she was never the same again. Littered throughout the hidden base beneath the Priory were hints to that tortured past and her mysterious new purpose. She had murdered Omad after leaving the machine and her mind was now set to some new task. Many drawings were shown of the pale tree being wrapped by thorns and a lineup of various alliances Scarlet was interested in forming among the Tyrian factions, some successful, several not. Tables lined up of equipment such as miniature probes, clockwork schematics, and an antitoxin injector. There also was found a portrait of Omad, Scarlet's mentor, with knives and rips throughout it. The most notable item found was a journal written by the Silvari herself. It documented Scarlet's activities as she was continuously tormented by an entity in her nightmares. The entity communicated to Scarlet through images of death, destruction, and destiny. By the concluding pages of the journal, Scarlet had been consumed by the entity entirely, it seemed, and was no longer scared of it, but rather working with it. Elsewhere, Rox had met with Ritlock Brimstone about her admission into the Tribune's famous Stone Warband. Her prior attempts had not been well received, including even doing battle with a newly powered to quattle the Sunless at Sparkfly Fen. Ritlock expressed that Rox definitely would get in if she did just one thing, kill Scarlet Briar. Later, Logan met with Marjorie. Marjorie had asked the captain if he knew anyone by the name of E, which Logan didn't, and the figure remained a mystery. But more of Kazmir's past was revealed. Not a noble or lady at all, she instead was a former noble of Divinity's Reach, her family having gone into bankruptcy when her brother gambled all their money away. Her father, taking the blame for his son, took the fall and went to debtor's prison, ending up dying there with Kazmir and her unseen brother having little left to their name. Lastly, there were the matter of the probes, some of which had caused disturbances in Blood Tide Coast. Here, three great grassy jungle worms had become agitated by them, now threatening the locals. Curiously joining the worms were husks, strange creatures loosely associated with the Nightmare Court and foreign to the lands of Blood Tide. What the probes had done, or what specifically was affecting these planty creatures, none could be sure. With the fall of the marionette, it was not long before things stirred in Lion's Arch once again. Aetherblade pirates were able to free their captain, Mai Trin. During their Dead of Night escape, the Aetherblades also approached Vigilante Kanak, another high-profile prisoner in custody of the Lion's Arch. When offered freedom at the hands of the Aetherblades, Kanak, though, deliberately chose not to escape with them. 
after Trin's departure, a message from Scarlet was played to the captain, telling her that she had work to do in the mists. The Aetherblades were able to create a portal to the mist, escaping Tyria altogether. In the commotion, Tymie ran after the captain through their portal in the hopes of getting close to Scarlet, and Bram reluctantly followed behind, leaving the two stranded in the mists as well. Now, one of the mysterious probes, this one that had been placed in the waters at Lion's Arch, turned green. Only one. Just this one. For what reason this was, was unknown. In the Dead End Bar in Divinity's Reach, the Commander, Marjorie, Casimir, and Rox took note of the probe. They brought news of its changing to the Dermond Priory, who Marjorie was revealed to be in good standing with, and hoped that they could conduct an investigation about what was happening. In the mists, Bram and Timey followed Mytrin, but Timey's golem Scruffy was quickly damaged. For most Asura, this would not be too much of a problem, but it was revealed that Timey needs Scruffy to get around. She was suffering from a critical medical condition that had impaired the use of her legs her whole life. It was getting worse as she grew older, and Timey assumed that the condition would soon take the rest of her body. It's why she relied so heavily on her golem Scruffy, and with it now out of action, Timey couldn't pursue the Aetherblades any further. Bram, who had become quite protective and big brotherly of Timey, helped to escort her back out of the mists. She explained, though, that she admired Scarlet's stance on freedom, going beyond the realms of what should be capable for her kind, and likened that to herself. Timey also realised that the probes were likely related to the ley lines Scarlet had discovered at the Thormanova reactor. She described ley lines as being analogous to ocean currents or weather patterns, but stirring magic instead of water or air. Ley lines are paths that magic chooses to follow. In normal situations, ley lines might be difficult to detect, see or touch, but they are real, deep below the ground. After Marjorie had called in her favours from the Dermond Priory, she set about to find answers. Too long they had been left in the dark. She, with the help of Vorp and Kazmir and the Commander, began an investigation of the past year. A piece of Omad's machine was scavenged, and Vorp deduced that the machine did not, in fact, break Scarlet's mind. But instead, Omad's machine had only revealed a piece of Scarlet's mind that had always existed a part of the Silvari. It was also revealed that the probes were likely created by the Molten Alliance technologies and definitely were searching for ley lines. The attack on the captain's council at the hands of Mytrin, who wanted the captain's seat, was evidence Scarlet was interested in weakening Lion's Arch. It was supposed the Aetherblades were established for air superiority in any large battle or war. It was discovered that steam creatures operated very similarly to Scarlet's own clockwork machines, and that those technological similarities were how she had managed to utilise those strange creatures, though she still wasn't necessarily the architect of them or their true purpose. When studying new toxins from the Toxic Alliance, Marjorie discovered that it had now become more resistant to the antitoxin she used beforehand. It was deduced that Scarlet deliberately lured the heroes into creating an antitoxin so that Scarlet could later create a more potent mix capable of resisting it and taking out more people, such as those in an entire city. All these plans, and the heroes reminded themselves that while Scarlet believed them to be of her own design, her journal had perhaps revealed that another consciousness was gradually taking control of her, and in fact it could be this entity that was feeding the ideas. With every crucial fact laid out, Marjorie and company were able for the first time to get one step ahead of Scarlet and anticipate her next move. They concluded she planned a raid on Lion's Arch where the one green probe and potential ley line lay in waiting. Scarlet was indeed planning an assault on the city, and she came in force. 
During this time, Aetherblade airships snuck into Lion's Arch from above and began the assault on the Free City, destroying the Asura Gates to stop reinforcements. After the surprise attack from the skies, Molten and Toxic Alliance infantry began to swarm the city. The Molten burrowed up through the ground and the Toxic arrived by the sea. As the invasion progressed, a grand flying platform, enormous, rivaling the size of the glory of Tyria or the Zephyr Sanctum, entered Sanctum Harbor from the skies. Scarlet called the immense construct the Breachmaker, and before long as it hovered above the city, it deployed an immense drill that burrowed into the ground where the green probe was lying. As the invasion continued, the factions began to unleash a miasma into the air that slowly engulfed the region. Some citizens were able to flee the city, including Evan Nashblade. The merchant of the Black Lion Trading Company attempted to flee the city, herding his valuable merchant Doliax with him. The main gates of the city were destroyed in the beginning assault, save for one. The gate was reconfigured, and Nashblade went through it, somehow able to close it behind him, effectively trapping the citizens behind within the city to protect himself. Captain Magnus, the bloody handed, spearheaded the Lion Guard defense at Fort Mariner. During a skirmish with the Molten Alliance, Magnus was injured, losing an eye. The attack was repelled as Captain Ellen Keel was able to get to the city with her own flying Aetherblade airship. The miasma soon reached critical levels and forced even the Lion Guard to escape under Keel's order. Magnus, determined to hold the fort, which had never been lost in all his lifetime, denied her orders. But Keel stood up to her now equal and forced Magnus on her airship, along with Kanark, still a prisoner forced to watch on, and a few others. The surviving Lion Guard and others fled far from the city. As a result of the attack, several new refugee camps were erected surrounding the city. The most prominent were at the Vigil Keep, at Bouldermouth Vale, and at Stormbluff Isle. In response to the attack, Divinity's Reach was able to send hot air balloons to aid in the relief efforts. The Vigil chose to aid the wounded and opened their doors to the refugees. Within the camp, the healers were swarmed with dealing with wounded from force trauma, combat wounds, and most of all, the miasmic gas. They concluded that the gas was able to kill one out of every two patients. It was highly caustic. Most afflicted expired in agony when it was inhaled. Field hospitals were stationed in open air due to the vigil's infirmary being packed with wounded. Within the field hospital, Subdirector Null's consortium Golem was now named Helotron and did its best to assist people. Timey continued to question refugees about whether Scarlet was actually sighted in the attack of Lion's Arch. She explained to the commander that she no longer wanted to work with the mass murderer, but only to observe her genius. It was also revealed that Zodja, Timey's guardian, did not know she was at the Vigil Keep at all. In the Bouldermouth Vale camp at Lornars Pass, Kazmir and Marjorie waited together until the miasma dissipated. They explained the devastation, that for every person they evacuated, three more would die. Marjorie reminisced of her time at the Ministry Guard. She spoke of her mother and sisters, but not her father, suggesting that he wasn't a good man as Kazmir's father was. Shortly after Marjorie quit the Ministry Guard, she had joined the Dermond Priory, knowing she could tap into a good source of information to be a detective with them. She expressed the Order of Whispers were a little too secretive for her taste. All the heroes could do now was sit and wait and watch as the miasma dissipated and Scarlet continued to drill from the Breachmaker. Slowly, as the days passed by, the miasma was pushed out into the Sea of Sorrows by wind. The Lion Guard were able to regroup with the Three Orders and chose to storm Lion's Arch and establish rally points to take the fight back to Scarlet. The collective force was able to re-establish a foothold in the battered remains of their city. They were able to take the Traders Forum and waited there until reinforcements arrived. When they did, Scarlet sent out her main Assault Knights Twisted forms and machines that seem to have been inspired from the lessons learned with the twisted marionette. Yet, without the miasma assailing them, the allied forces were still able to gain ground. With Scarlet alive, 
Magnus theorized that they would soon reach a stalemate. He ordered a line guard contingent, including Ellen Keel, to board her airship and kill Scarlet on the Breachmaker once and for all. Rox, Bran, Kazmir, Marjorie, and the commander volunteered to enter, as well as Helatron, who for his part did his best to sustain the group. Getting into the Breachmaker was difficult. The Allies were tasked with reconfiguring Scarlet's teleporter machines used by the Assault Knights. With this successful, they were able to teleport directly onto the ship and met Scarlet head on. First, the Silvari hid behind a powerful hologram of herself. As the battle raged, the hologram began taxing on the energy of Scarlet and the Breachmaker, forcing her to dissipate it and luring her into a fight for herself. A strong combatant, she was still no match for the forces of Lion's Arch and assorted companions. Wounded and deranged, she screamed as she escaped into the Breachmaker's lower levels, determined to not let the drill fail. In the ensuing moments, Captain Ellen Keel was injured and chose to retreat through the portal, allowing the others to take the fight forward. Helatron followed the captain, choosing to sustain other wounded Lion Guard. It was Rox, Bram, Kazmir, Marjorie and the Commander that ended in the lower depths of the Breachmaker, only to find the crazed Silvari on the ground attempting to hold her own. Bram told Rox to finish the job. With her scoring the killing blow, she could finally get into the stone warband. As they approached the Silvari, Scarlet called out, asking if any had wondered why she orchestrated so much chaos and destruction the past year. Bram denied her chance to elaborate, but Scarlet responded that soon Tyria would bow before a new master. Soon, Marjorie was upon her, dagger drawn, and in that moment, Scarlet triggered one last explosion that threw all of them back. It was devastating. Bram, flung back, had broken his leg. Rox was distant enough to survive without injury, but rather than going for Scarlet, she chose to stay with her injured friend instead. Marjorie too, close to the explosion and taking the brunt of the blast, was badly wounded. She was unmoving and unresponsive to Kazmir, who went to tend to her lover. The Mesmer believed Marjorie to be dead. Enraged, Kazmir turned her wrath to Scarlet, demonstrating the true depths of her mesmeric capabilities. With illusions, Kazmir was able to distract Scarlet long enough for the commander to get close and deliver one fatal killing blow to their hated enemy. In Scarlet's dying breath, the Silvari exclaimed that they were all fools in thinking they were saved. As the rumbling of the Breachmaker continued with its drill, it at last hit its mark. Over Scarlet's decaying body, the whole machine turned blue. The drill struck the ley lines deep beneath the city, and an intense magical light exploded around them. But the energy did not linger at Lion's Arch. Scarlet had redirected the ley line elsewhere. It rocketed off far from the city, out west toward the Thormanova reactor and beyond, into the distant Maguma jungle beyond the Brisbane wildlands. The light continued downwards, deep below the earth once again, before finally striking and feeding something new. Something waiting to accept it, sleeping deep beneath the earth. And now it rumbled and moved as a pair of enormous teeth began to open. Another elder dragon had awakened. The Breachmaker had reached critical mass. It soon spiralled out of control, with the drilling completed, and exploded. Fragments of the airship were sent through the ruined city of Lion's Arch, changing the very landscape and destroying what few buildings had survived the initial assault. Lion's Arch was devastated. It would never be the same again and take years for the people to rebuild into something new. As the battle ended, with the now leaderless, straggling invaders finally being driven out and disbanded, a somber mood fell over the ruins. Squatters began to take to the former city, looking for a place to stay, even after the advice from the Lion Guard that it was still uninhabitable and potentially toxified. Soon after, looters too came to pick apart the city for anything they could find. Among the looters and gawkers were the Pact, 
The Pact had been entirely absent from this saga, but here, at last, they made an official appearance through the Silvari member, Lorantha of the Wild. Lorantha explained that the reason the Pact did not officially help with Lion's Arch is because that is not the mission of the Pact. They have been tasked with the slaying of Elder Dragons, and there was much to do to rebuild strength after the massive assault on Zaitan. Defending a city from attack fell outside of their charter. However, when a dragon's cry was heard from the Maguma jungle rippling throughout the realm, they sprung into action. The pact now believed that Scarlet's drilling had roused a dragon. Lorantha explained that if they had known that Scarlet's plan all along was to awaken an elder dragon, they could have justified getting involved in the affairs of the independent city, but unfortunately they did not. From now though, Traherne and the pact would take a more active role. Meanwhile, within the Dead End Bar, in the eastern commons of Divinity's Reach, the Commander, Kazmir, Marjorie, Rox and Bram had a celebration of their victory over Scarlet Briar. Bram was limping from his broken leg throughout the celebration. Later on, Tymie entered the bar to join the group. They surmised that the ley lines were an ocean of magic and Scarlet had thrown a giant rock in the ocean, sending ripples out towards this dragon. After a while, Seraph Belinda Delacroix entered the bar looking for her little sister, Marjorie. They shared a brief moment where Belinda revealed she would soon be on an expedition at the Brisbane Wildlands towards where the dragon's cry was heard. Rox had her own reasons for being at the bar. She was hiding from Ritlock. She was afraid to report to the Tribune since technically she had failed to kill Scarlet. She had been ignoring his summons and instead had chosen to focus on this unlikely new group of friends. So there they sat, enjoying each other's company in this fragile time, wondering about the distant, desolate lands to the west and a new dragon's roar.